Good evening, everyone. My name is David Harris. I'm with the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. And on behalf of my partners at the Transformative uh, Justice Program, Kaya Stern and uh, Tracy Jones, uh, I want to welcome you to Harvard Law School. Uh, it's really great for us to be here in this room to see a lot of people out here from across the river. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of uh, Professor Ogletree when he used to run Saturday school back in the day. And uh, we were able to have this kind of turnout and this kind of mixture, and it's really important for today's film. So I want to thank those of you who ventured across the river to join us. Uh, we really appreciate it. <clears throat> So, you know, and I think this crowd speaks to the urgency of the topic of the film we're going to see today, and it means a lot. Uh, before introducing uh, the, the director, uh, I want to say uh, it gives me a, a, a great deal of encouragement to think that this many people will turn out and that we're all kind of committed and determined to be supportive of the young people in our communities who uh, tend to be overlooked, neglected, and uh, demonized. I think it's really important for us to have an understanding of what's going on, and we really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, I want to ex extend a special thanks to my colleague, Kelly Garvin, uh, who I promised two weeks ago when we did a big race, racism and mental health conference that we wouldn't have any more. Uh, but she helped pull this off with good cheer and good grace, and so all thanks and praise to Kelly. So at this point, uh, I really just want to introduce uh, Rudy Hippolyte, uh, an independent filmmaker who many of you may know, know his work. Uh, we uh, screened his earlier film, Push, Madison versus Madison, uh, and uh, it and this film certainly uh, are, are testament to what you can do if you give voice to those who are often not heard, not seen, uh, by uh, more mainstream uh, 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 artists. And um, uh, his current project sounds quite interesting. I'm very interested to see it. It's going to be on uh, black barber shops and hair salons. So with no further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Rudy Hippolette, Trinidadian born, raised in Roxbury. Uh, and uh, following the screening, there will be a conversation uh, with uh, Dennis Wilson, the producer, Conan Harris, the Deputy Director of Public Safety for the City of Boston, Donnell Singleton, the CEO of Origin Nile Publishing, and Donald M. Osgood, uh, advocate at the Louis D. Brown uh, Peace Institute. With no further ado, Rudy, please uh, introduce the film. Yeah, thank you so much, David, and I really appreciate the fact that the Institute is sponsoring the film, and we're finally coming uh, home to Harvard so I can share it with some of my colleagues and some of the community. I want to thank you for coming out, um, and I think it's, it's an important film. I think you get to hear uh, the stories from young men that you would not normally hear. We hear about, uh, especially recently, about the, the uh, spike in, in uh, gang violence in our community. And there are a lot of reasons behind it. And hopefully, this film will illustrate why these young men are involved. And, and uh, essentially, because of lack of opportunities and lack of choices, this is what happens. But there are incredible organizations that work within this realm to help these young people who are going through this. Just then the one that I work with was Street Safe Boston and making their film. But uh, one of the things that I have is a list of other organizations that's doing incredible work with, with these young people around employment, around mental health counseling, and there's so many different things that's needed. And what's needed is, is uh, a holistic or really comprehensive approach to dealing with this. Um, so I tend, I don't want to say too much. I'd like to uh, show the film and then uh, answer your questions and have the other uh, experts who are here with me, I'm just a filmmaker, who can speak to some of the questions you may have. Or if you have questions about the filmmaking process itself, I'll be happy to answer that. But thank you so much for taking the time to come out tonight. Thank you, folks. Um, we're going to have some of the folks from Street Save Boston uh, come up on stage, and uh, we're available to answer any questions you may have. Omira, would you mind coming up? And uh, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge there are a couple of folks 
from the production crew, um, Carl, Carl Miller, uh, Malik Williams, Brett, if you guys don't mind standing up. Uh, yeah, the, uh, any, any filmmaking process is a real collaboration, so that's what this is. So um, I guess we'll have each of you introduce yourselves. They're all in the film, and then Dennis Wilson, he's the co-producer and uh, also co-owner of Creative Buzz. Hello everyone, my name is Omaira Alisea and I was a program coordinator at Street Safe Boston. Hello, my name is Conan Harris. I was the manager of the street worker program out of Street Safe Boston. Hey everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Dennis Wilson, co-producer and good friend and like a brother to Rudy. Donnell Singleton, I too was a program coordinator at Street Safe Boston. And Donald Osgood, I was one of the street workers at Street Safe Boston. So, yeah, so if, if you have any questions, I just want to say. I'm sorry. Yeah, and and ahead, also sorry. on the hospital response team. Thank right. you, Omira. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That was important. And, and uh, I just want to say that after we did the filming, uh, the, the staff of uh, Street Safe, they were great in allowing myself and, and Dennis Wilson in to see the work they were doing and to also uh, introduce us to some of these young men. And essentially, if they had not worked with the young men and gone into trust of them, there's no way they would have spoken to us. So I just want to make that clear. So if, if, uh, if there are any questions to anyone up here uh, or myself, we'd love to, to answer it. And thank you again for coming out. Anyone? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, how you guys doing and thank you. Um, so my question is to all of you guys is, how long did the actual documentary take to, to be filmed? Because some of the videos you had in there were filmed between 2010, 2012, especially for Bob from Warren Gardens. Um, and what was the process to actually recruit for the people inside the video? So I didn't see anybody from Orchard Park. I didn't see anybody from the Point 8 bus, Heat Street, Humboldt. And I'm just saying from a Roxbury resident myself, so. Right. Okay, so I'll answer the first part. So we came in, I, uh, uh, you know, spent some time with the staff. Yeah. This was in 2013, the summer, myself okay. and coach. Makes sense. And then I, I usually try to embed myself to, so that I could get a good sense of what's happening. Uh, so in 20, Conan and Ed Powell were able to get us, go to the Boston Foundation who funded the program. Okay. And they were able to, to actually get us permission. There were many filmmakers asking to do films okay. on Street Safe, but for some reason, I don't know why Conan. But, um, <laughs> but in any case, 2013, we started filming. Then we filmed 2014, 2015. Uh, uh, 2016 was the last filming we did. Some of the footage we saw, you saw with Warren Gardens uh, was actually video we, we got from the actual young people. But if you guys want to speak to why we didn't feature some of the other uh, neighborhoods. So, um, just so um, we, we had specific catchment areas in the city of Boston. I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Um, this film got done by Rudy and Coach surrounding me at another vi at another movie premiere and kind of talking about it. Uh, we felt like it was so important if some of the work that we was doing, we wanted folks to be able to get a chance to see it, not knowing anything. All we knew as a body in Street Safe is that we wanted it to be an authentic picture and depiction of some of the work that was being done. Okay. Catchment area wise, we work with 20 specific groups. Some of the groups in which you named, but this was a voluntary basis, right? Some young people was more open to doing it than others. That's, that's um, what I and thought. And that was really yeah. what it was about. Now, I think that if we pushed it, we could have had other groups in there, but the truth of the matter is that, it, and I'm sure Rudy and them had a lot of other footage that they could have used, but you wanted yeah. to be specific in some of the messaging that you were talking about. Correct. 
All right, yeah. thank you. I, if it were up to me, we would have a five-hour movie. <laughs> I'm, I just want to say, uh, certainly, I thoroughly enjoyed what you showed. So I'm hoping that this will even be shown even more because, again, opening up people's eyes to see raw, real footage of what people walking around don't really get or understand or understand even the programming, the, the importance of programming such as Street Safe and many other of the organizations that you have which are trying to come together to do something. So I am really grateful. I just saw, I got a text about this last night and I just had to make it in my way to come here today. And I just want to take my hats off to Rudy, to all of you all, all the production staff, everybody that worked on it in any kind of way, all of the people that gave us their stories, their lives, their real things. And I say this too because I come from a family of 13. I was brought up in a household with both parents and all of my siblings. My parents over, have over 250 grandchildren and great-grandchildren and stuff, so I understand the value of family and what's really, truly, honestly needed. And so I'm hoping that it opened, if it didn't open your eyes today, that it did tonight open your eyes in some sort of manner. So we are all responsible for something. We all have to be responsible to give back in some sort of way ourselves. You need to find that within your own self to do it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank, you, you. thank you, Michael. That, that's a very key point. Um, I, and I do want to really thank you guys, each of you seated here, because it means you care and you want to come out and, and experience something. So I appreciate that. Um, I'd like, to, as a uh, retired educator, I'm a retired history teacher and dean of discipline, Dennis Wilson here. Um, and thank you again on behalf of uh, Street Safe Boston and, and This Ain't Normal Film and Rudy and myself for coming out. I know you could be somewhere else doing a lot of enjoyable things, but uh, as an educator, I hope that the, the people in the district office that are educating our children, uh, just like the hollowed halls of Harvard here that we are here, uh, that every young man needs to see and young lady needs to see this movie. I hope that, that the school department and the superintendent will put this in all the school libraries so all the young people can see from elementary to middle school. Well, maybe a little bit too raw for elementary, but middle school, high schools, so they can see that there's a need that these young men, as you saw, these young men, as we interviewed them, uh, have so many God-gifted abilities. They are so blessed in so many ways. But they didn't receive the, the, the opportunities, and a lot of doors weren't open for them, and so unfortunately got caught up, as they say. But I know that if we can get two parents, to schools, to, to folks like yourself, that we can make a difference in some of these young men's lives. Some of them, of course, need some mental health, uh, uh, services and some of them just need an opportunity. I want to take an opportunity to thank these gentlemen and young ladies for the incredible jobs that they did with those young men. Because many of them young men, yeah. Many of those young men are doing well and many of them unfortunately aren't doing well. Many of them, some of them young men are no longer with us because they've made bad decisions in their lives. So uh, I hope you spread the word. I hope you get the word out uh, because we want this to go not only national but global because this problem is not just in Boston. This is unfortunately a systemic problem that's throughout the country. And we're losing too many valuable young lives that, that are just wasted. So I just wanted to share that with you uh, again and thank you so much for coming. Yeah, and, and thank you, Coach. I, I wonder if one of you could maybe speak to Street Safe and, and what happened to Street Safe, and then we'll take your question, Lloyd, if you don't mind. Uh, I just want to give a sense. Street Safe is no longer, and maybe somebody can give some context, but everybody here is working in other positions around the same issues. Hey, I, uh, brother, brother Rudy, I just want to let the, the young man there go first because okay. he's been standing for quite some time. Okay. All right. I, Sorry, really, <laughs> I, uh, I wasn't expecting to get that kind of recognition about being a young man. 
but I really relate to that in my own experience. So I may not look it, but I sure feel it. Um, we're living in a time now when things are changing rapidly. They're, they're changing in a way that we're not even close to being aware as to how rapidly they're changing. Um, between now and the summer, um, I feel that this country will not be recognizable anymore in terms of where it's at tonight. And it's going to mean that in a major positive sense or a major negative sense. But there's no two ways. The more time that goes by, the more the answers become clear, one way or the other. There's a tremendous pressure in this in this world, but especially tonight in this country, there's a tremendous pressure for there to be the start of an entirely new human movement. It's hard for me to say it because it comes from a very deep place of pain and aspiration. No longer is there time for us to talk about staying in our lane, being a part of a women's movement and staying in our lane, being a part of the Me Too movement and staying in our lane, being a part of Black Lives Matter and staying in our lane. Not anymore. The time's running out and even if we can't see it, the more time that goes by, the less we can afford to keep our separate drives and our separate platforms. There has to be a movement that not talks about Democrats or Republicans or any other kind of social organization or groups. It starts to talk about a human movement. And it starts locally in all the areas around the country where people can appreciate this. So the reason I'm bringing this up tonight is because you guys have gone a long, long way in the direction of making this whole movement, this awakening human movement drive. Starting wherever you are in your community to reach out to where there's suffering in other communities because the suffering doesn't have a color the suffering doesn't have an income. It's happening all over the country. In every community, there's pain. In every community, there's suffering. In any community, there's fear and uncertainty. You guys, I hope and pray, will find a way to be able to use all this information, all this work that you've done to help to trigger the start of this human movement. That's my wish for you. And the last thing is, you left me wondering whether or not you, there's any follow-up stories about that woman with her three children. If there's anybody here tonight who, who can tell us anything more about where, how she's doing now. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Lloyd. That was beautiful. I'll, to answer your question, Lloyd, I just, I've, been, I've kept up with Daquan and uh, his mom and uh, his three brothers over the, when we started, stopped filming in the 2016. 
So for Daquan, uh, he's been back and forth uh, in terms of being incarcerated for different things. His mom has been by his side. She's actually, she got a full-time job. She's working. Uh, she's, she's very heroic in my mind. Um, so she's, uh, he's, he's having, I recently found out he's having a child, but unfortunately he's back again. Um, so I've been, you know, trying to do what I can and uh, he just got his license. Yeah, not a license, his ID, which is a key, as Amira knows. So, so I've been in contact with Conan and we'll see if we can help him when he gets out, but I've been in contact with, with the family. And, and just to follow up on some of the other young men in the film, um, Joe Sierra, for example, um, is a young man that I spent a lot of time working with and have mentored over the years and continue to have a relationship with. He is actually doing extremely well. He has, um, he has all of his credentials to be a personal trainer um, locally. Um, he makes a wonderful salary. He still works with John Feynman at Inner City Weightlifting. They've expanded. He's become a manager there. Um, he's doing phenomenal. He's still not been back in prison, um, and it's going on about five to seven years. Yeah, he's doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't take the credit because all the things and all the work that was done at Street Safe Boston was truly a team effort. Like, you know, I would never assume the credit for any of the, you know, positive developments in the young people that we serve because we truly did it as a team. I mean, it was us in a room at times bumping heads, putting our heads together, figuring out how to solve a problem creatively, strategically. Um, and I'll let the, the other folks sort of answer for any other young people that they may know. I, I, I'll just get back a little bit to some of the question around where is Street Safe now? Um, I think that when it first started, it was a five-year mission from the Boston Foundation that gave funds for it to exist. Towards the end, that five years was coming towards the end and everybody was trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, the report finished, um, things was in play, and so the, when we came on, a new mayor came on to the city and what he wanted to do was be a part of our strategy. A lot of folks don't know is that when he was a state representative, he collaborated with Street Safe Boston on um, building pathways where we were able to get young men inside that program. And so when he became the mayor, we brought him on to take it on. Um, and what we try to do is pass along best practices once it was underneath the city. A lot of our street workers transferred, um, transferred and Omira's position did as well. It wasn't the same exact program and Street Safe Boston was a nonprofit where we had the nimbleness to be able to change when things were not going right. Um, it was not a perfect organization. We had our bumps and bruises. We learned a lot from that experience, but we always reached back about that once in a lifetime experience because that was a time where people genuinely cared about what was going on with our young people. And that was the first time I've ever seen collectively throughout an organization where everybody, uh, whether their capacity was at 10 to 1,000, brought their best foot to the table at times. And so even now, which is five years later, four years later, every time I see alumni from Street Safe Boss, or whether it be young, person or staff, there's a look that we have and a chemistry that we have because we remember such a time. Thank you. 
done. But again, as I said, because of cutting it out, alumni and stuff is good, but it's still going on. So, you know, you know, even for others to move into those positions, even to groom others to do that, the, the torch keeps getting fogged with the person in the app holding the torch, and they're dead. So, you know, people move on with jobs and things, but we still got to look at what the essence of the real importance is here for all of our lives, not just the math, those who are without, but the, you know, we're faced with having to be in those neighborhoods. We're faced with having to go anywhere in the city of Boston. So it should be that we need a signed petition to help you to get this film wherever you want to show it, because it needs to be shown. And also, as I said, it, it just needs to be, the funding needs to be revamped to look at again and, and to continue the program forward. It was making a difference. Yes, ma'am. So um, I've worked in the Department of Services in three of DYSs. I'm not totally proud of that, but I have. I tried to do best by the young people I could. I've also, in that program, I worked with kids who committed a homicide. And I'm always really struck by the fact that when you sit with them, they will talk with you. And that often there was ways that they got there that we could have avoided, which I don't need to tell anyone on that table that. But I guess I'm very frustrated. I'm very frustrated because I feel like we're having more homicides recently. We had a homicide, we had a, <clears throat> a listening, hearing meeting, and there was a homicide, and a nine-year-old boy lost his life right outside the meeting. And I'm just feeling frustrated because I can't help but notice that those lives are usually black and brown, and they're usually poor, and we seem to be allowing this to happen. And I'm not saying anyone up there is doing it, but it's still happening, and it just feels like it's, it's coming back worse. And I feel like, when are we going to stop it? Because we're just not actually stopping it. If I can just say, it really pains me. Because I've worked with some of those young people that people dismiss as not being valuable. And I know that, I know that there's a lot of empty chairs at Thanksgiving because of those deaths. And you know, there's birthdays and anniversaries and there's, there's human families that are gonna be living this the rest of our lives, but something's not happening in the city of Boston that needs to be happening. Um. Donald, give me a minute. Okay. So, uh, thank you for your, for your commentary. You know, the film is just, a microcosm, right, of, of the larger society and the complex urban issues that we're experiencing all across the country, and not just urban, right? And so, you know, this gentleman here talked a lot about that, but we have to collectively figure out how we're going to solve the issues of the next generation and of today, right? So it can't just be this film being shown, it has to be this film culminating with other direct action to help service you know, young people and, you know, and, and really dissecting the complexity of all the problems that really are, are challenging uh, this subset of young people. So, I understand, you know, what, I, what, I've, what I've been doing for the last five years is responding to shootings and stabbings and a lot of homicides. And we had that eight homicides in like two weeks of few weeks back, I actually responded to six of those. And in the process of that, I transitioned into a new job at the Peace Institute, which helps families who are, you know, family survivors of homicide victims. I think one of the things that Rudy and Coach wanted to do by showing this film is get it out there, you know, because a lot of people don't know that these young people they're regular people, and because of systematic, you know, systematic situations, you know, education, you know, low wages, you know, um, housing issues, substance abuse issues, you know, pushing drugs into the neighborhoods, the guns, we talk about the gun violence in the cities, and we talk about, you know, passing all this legislation and things for guns when actually those young people don't have gun licenses, right? So this 
this particular film is to provoke you, you know, and to provoke others to say, you know, enough is enough. And how do you participate in what Coach and Rudy did to make a difference? You know, some of you are probably connected to, you know, politicians and things like that that have, that have power. But how do we get together and say we're tired? How do we come together and stand up? Because these young people, I've seen a lot of them, not just not the ones only in this video, but throughout the city of Boston come through and I've seen them die right in front of me. So where do we say enough is enough? Because as the, as the younger gentleman was saying earlier, right, we're at a time now where it's about to start crossing into everyone's lives. There's no life that's exempt. So where do we go from here? Where do we stand up? And I think that's the purpose of this film. It's to make you think later on, what are you gonna do to be a part of the change that we need to see? Because that's the real question. And so how do we make that happen? Coach, Rudy, they put something together, start sharing it. You know, tell people that you know they have the money to do it, to put that money towards this film so that this film can go worldwide because it needs to happen. And that's why we did what we did. We didn't just, you know, a paycheck was, they couldn't even pay us enough to do the work that we did. They couldn't pay us enough. We were in harm's way every day when we were doing this work. We were with young people who, they didn't have anything to lose and the other young groups of people that wanted to get to them, they didn't have anything to lose. But because they trusted us and we were consistent in their lives, our lives were in danger every day. We didn't have guns, we didn't have bulletproof vests. So the question today is, how are you going to be a part of the change? How are you gonna help this film get nationwide publicity so that other people get to see that these young people's lives are important? You see the young man with his daughter, you see him with his two daughters, you see the other young mom trying to raise her four sons, one of her sons has been shot, you know, you get to see all these things. These young men didn't have hope. And they don't have hope because of a system. So how do we come together? Because we have to break the racial barrier and start making a difference. Because at some point, what I've learned doing this work in five years, right? Guns, violence, it doesn't discriminate. At any point, it could be anybody that's even in this room right now. So that's the real question. How are you going to help get this film nationwide? I think that there's um, I would agree with you. <laughs> I would take it a, a tiny step further and just say this. Let's deal with some realities. And let's not pretend that there's not an elephant in the room. And if there's not an elephant in the room, let me open the door so the elephant can come in the room, right? So we live in a society, where we're talking about a billion dollar enterprise, prison system, right? We're talking about, does anyone really want to see an ultimate solution? Yeah. Because what happens when there's a solution? You have less police officers, you have less COs, you have less workers in DYS, you have less lawyers, you have less judges, you have few individuals, Bob Barker's gonna go out of business because he's making the soap and the shoes and, 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 and everything else, right? So now you have to ask, we have to ask ourselves what type of society, because this, this whole situation is about what type of society do we want? You know, if we, we're in a society and it might as well be a caste-based system. You dig? Because now you're, you're dealing with a group of individuals, and I'm not speaking of the individuals in the, f in, in the film. I mean a group of individuals who are living below the poverty level. And there's a systematic plot to keep that there. We live in a capitalistic society where in order for it to function, there has to be someone at the top and there has to be someone at the bottom and all the fish in between. When we think about our school system, now everyone understands and knows it's a pipeline to prison. So you have youngsters dropping out of the schools because the school isn't offering them anything. So when we say, well, how do we change it? Really, we gotta ask ourselves, do we want it to change? Because if we want it to change, as um, Rusty said in the film, it could be changed. But at what cost? That what happens to our society. How many people are gonna lose jobs, right? Living wage. If the city of Boston, you damn near need $1,600 for a one bedroom. But at the same time, you're making $11 an hour 
which is really, when you look at inflation, might be equivalent to $6 an hour based upon what you have to pay to survive. So there's a whole lot systematically that would have to change in order for these youth to actually envision themselves living a normal life. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, I work for the State Public Defenders, and I was wondering how you protected people in the film, especially if they're on probation or parole, or what they said on the film could be used against them in further cases. How, do, how did that work in terms of protecting them from that information being used? Or how, how did that work? Because, I mean, they were, uh, so I, what, did, what did you do so they weren't? Uh, yeah, to, to be honest with you, we had them sign a release form, but we didn't do anything, but they wanted to, to, to tell their story. They wanted to do this. So the question you're asking, there isn't, yeah. There, there wasn't no specific filters. Um, however, as you can see, there was no deliberate um, things that were being said that can literally about a particular charge. As you see, when a young man got shot in the video, he was like, yeah, 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 it was a misunderstanding. <laughs> Nobody has specific things that had people caught up in crimes um, outside of maybe marijuana that was illegal at the moment and at the time. You also have to keep in mind that on a on a day to day basis, on a day to day basis, the individuals that were working with the uh, the youth that worked with our street workers, the program coordinators, pretty much they understood and knew what they had to trust us. So it's not like the information that came to us we were going to give out the information to anyone um, for any reason. So it was definitely a lot of trust that was already previously built. And like Brother Conan also just stated, that in the film itself, again, no, no specifics were ever given. I should say, during the street worker, uh, uh, street worker meetings and uh, program card. coordinators meetings, codes were used. No names were, were said. Thank you all so much for being here and sharing this tremendous film with us. Um, I wanted to know about some of the institutional pressures Street Safe might have felt as an organization when you were still alive and functioning. Um, in particular, whether you got pressure from other institutions in the city of Boston, like the BPD or any other uh, kind of law enforcement or quasi-law enforcement institutions. And if this is a complicated question to answer, I apologize. But um, I'm thinking personally about the lawsuit that was just filed by the ACLU and a bunch of other organizations to attack the BPD gang database and thinking about how much insight you all might have behind the scenes and how there could have been pressure on you to divulge that information. So if you could speak to those complexities, I think that would be really insightful for us. Uh, so that was one of the uh, things that we had to be faced with often. But um, I, I'll never forget this. Um, during the time when the, the, there was a former uh, police commissioner, and not Willie Gross, but there was a, another commissioner, and had major issues with my staff being with guys every day, all day, on those corners, on those blocks, in those situations. And so I had to bring them down to a visual, and I said, you know, when you go by that block and you see them with them, you're saying, what are they doing with them? When I see them, if they're not with them, I'm saying, where are they? And so our mindset was totally different in how we approached the work. It was really about giving them an understanding about what we was there to do. Now, everybody didn't get it, and that's fine. We, did, we came there to support young people and helping their lives be better. Yes, sir. In the spirit of change, you know, we were, we were speaking about a bit ago, um, and knowing that survivor-led causes um, are some of the most successful, right? We have to let people in the community lead the charge and the change in their community. Do we, do you, can you, any of you guys offer ideas on how we're incorporating young men's opinions in change um, and how we can mobilize, continue to mobilize those voices and include young men around the table surrounding how we're creating change in the community. Let me speak to that. Um, I, you're, you're right on, right on. <laughs> yeah. Comment. Um, I'm, I'm not 
trying to toot my horn in any way. Uh, I am also a coach, and I also was a founder of the Boston Raiders Youth Football and Cheerleading Program. This is, and I'm only 32. I just got premature gray. This is one of my former players here. And one of the biggest things, not only in the urban city, in the city, in, in, in the suburban uh, uh, parts of, of, of a city, is having young people belonging to and interacting in positive way with positive people. Having young ladies with positive female and male role models. Having young men being around positive male and female role models. Helping them that come from dysfunctional families like I came from. That I knew, man, that my coach or, or teacher that really loved me was that surrogate father or that mother that I needed. See, these young men and young ladies, if given, as I mentioned earlier, the opportunity, whether they want to be into vocation and, and uh, technology or, or uh, uh, we got kids, these gentlemen and young ladies were putting kids into the trades. Uh, when, I te when I speak, I tell young people now, because I came up in, 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 in the 1800s, and everything, you got to go to school, you got to go to school, you got to go into service. See, now when I speak, college isn't for everybody. Why not, if you want to be an electrician, you want to be a plumber, you want to be HVAC, you want to be an architect, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? As you can see, Boston, there's cranes everywhere. I work at a technical vocational school called Madison Park High School. It's by design that they never put any money into the school, allowed it to deteriorate and just put, give it the, a, a very negative reputation. And we have great kids in our school that could go to Boston Latin if they wanted to. But I say, uh, right on for MP, yeah. <laughs> but I, I just want to, and, and, and I want to uh, rewind in terms of our young people, you know, need strong, tough love. Our young people need to hear that they can be somebody. Our young people, young people have to believe that there's hope. These guys and these young ladies gave them hope. I give my ball players hope. I let them know that I was eating bread for Sunday dinner a casserole that I thought was a delicacy for Sunday dinner. I mean, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. This film, I always uh, equate it, and I tell Rudy, it's about opening eyes and saving lives. This gentleman, Donald, is a pastor now, and he preaches and he preaches and he preaches. We can't save them all, but we can save many. Each and every one of you all can make a difference, whether it's in a small way or a major way. By what? Supporting these young brothers and young sisters. By letting them know they can be somebody. They, don't, they lack spiritual grounding and a spiritual foundation. They lack educational opportunity. They lack putting, being put in programs. They were instrumental in getting them IDs, licenses, getting them jobs, relocating them. See, there's a, a, a systematic, as, as, as Brother Darnell said, about what? School to prison pipeline. It's a billion dollar industry from what? Those orange suits that they wear, from the food that is, is prepared, from the electricity to, to, for the lights to be on, and so on and so on and so on. Okay? This, the haves and the have nots. Too many of the have nots and, and, and very little of the haves. Okay? We're, we're going through a phase, and I'm not going to get political because we all know, okay, that this. The, the, that, that the moral fiber of America is deteriorating. We've got an individual that is trying to divide black from whites and whites from blacks and from poor, from rich and rich and poor. And we're not gonna allow that to happen. So voting, this is what this gentleman said, voting can make a difference. Because if we put the right people in office, if we put the right people that care about all people, because we're all God's children, I don't care if you're white, I don't care if you're Latino, I don't care if you're Asian, I don't care if you're a Republican or, or uh, independent or, or Democrat, and even some Dixiecrats, that's what I used to teach in my history class. It's about the human race. It's about caring about all people. It's about giving people a chance to be what they want to be, as long as it's something positive. So I hope you, you ladies and gentlemen will spread the word. Yeah, we want this film to go global. We want everybody to see, because there's a lot of people in the suburbs that think we live in a jungle. We don't live in a jungle. It's where my mama lived, and I had to live with my mama, okay, because I... Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. So, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning. 
You're right. You ain't never too old to learn, even though I'm an educator. So I just wanted to share that because, again, we've got so many gifted young people. They're out there right now. The young lady is clicking at me. I'll click back. Okay. <laughs> that, that with support, support a young person. Help a young person. Open a door for a young person. Let a young person know that they are somebody and they can be somebody. And I guarantee you, I've got young men and young ladies calling me from all over the country that they felt I made an impact in their life, just like these people on this board. Before I go to you, I just want to acknowledge our musical director before we forget. Did you all love that music? Yeah. This young, where's, where's, there he is, Malik Williams. The, 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 the amazing Malik Williams. And I just had to, he created the music for our other documentary in this one. I just did not want to leave you out, my brother. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, I had a couple of comments and a couple of questions, if you give me the time. Uh, first of all, the reason I came is because I wanted to see the perspectives of the kids that they put on TV, on the front pages of the news, on the, on the, on the cops' TV shows, on the, like, like the, the one perspective in the movies, the one perspective you see, but you never see a human face. You never see the human story. Uh, f for the kids that always make the headlines. And, and, and I really wanted to see, to come and, and just kind of looking at it and, and, and seeing, you know, it's funny, you call it, the movie is This Ain't Normal. Unfortunately for those kids in those neighborhoods, it is normal. Right. It's not normal for the rest of society, right. but it, it is normal for them. Yeah. But to dig a little bit deeper and you guys peel back um, exactly who they are and exactly how they got into the situations they got into. And, and it's like there but for the grace of God go I. Exactly. Who knows who could have been in any of those situations? And that's where you were born. And you do what people where you're born do. Um, one of the things I'd, I'd like to say, what stood out to me in the film is that one of, the, one of the kids said, well, we have a half a circle. And I'd like to ask the panel, what would you like to see to fill in that other half of the circle? Number one. So if you could do that, it, any would, perspective? Yeah, I can. Um, Hit it. <laughs> <laughs> First, absolute, true, unlimited funding, resources, right? There needs to be, if for all intents and purposes, a pavilion needs to be housing. Because if a young man has to worry about the roof over his head, it's hard to get through at all. These young men go to prison, they get out of prison, and they have stay away orders from where their entire family lives. So where are they supposed to live? So then they end up couch surfing, or they stay in what is classified as trap houses, places where they sell drugs. So we need a pavilion that has housing, transitional housing, right? We need, on that same pavilion, we need the actual things that Madison Park High School should have. Technical trades should be taught there. We need financial literacy being taught there. We need on-site um, um, counselors, counselors <laughs> there, right? We need counselors also for the staff because often at times we're going crazy our damn selves. So yeah, you know we, we need to be helped too. And we also need partnerships, real partnerships, with employers who don't just say, we're Corey friendly, but then the only job you're gonna give my young man is to get the damn carriages in the parking lot, right? So we, we, need, we need that. In addition to that, we need partnerships with colleges and universities who often, if you have a drug conviction, either A, you can't go, or B, they're not gonna give you financial aid, right? So. And we also need something for the families, right? Because if I'm working with Donald, but now no one's helping Donald's mom, or his, or his brother, or his father, or whomever else is in that house, guess what? I done gave him an injection of hope, right? Now he's gonna go home and he might get six injections of, of defeat. You dig? So it has, when he says fill in that circle, it's not just the youth that we have to work with. We have to work with that youth's entire family and we need a damn safe haven. We need a space in our city where guess what? They know that their 
safe zone. They don't have to worry about getting shot. They don't have to worry about getting stabbed. They can go to school online if they have to. They can get counseling. They, and so that's what we need. We need somebody to open the damn checkbook and write the check, right? We need, instead of telling New Balance and all these other folk when you're giving them multi-million dollar tax breaks, say, no, listen, we're not gonna give you a tax break. What we want you to do is give 10 million over here, right? Then you go tell the Patriots, now you give another 10 million. You tell the Celtics, damn it, you give 10 million. You tell the Red Sox, you give 10 million. We need some money. Hello. To add, what, uh, to add to what Brother Donna was saying too, you know, we're assets. People are assets, right? So the other part of that circle also includes like you, how many young men did you hear in this film talk about the absence of a father, the absence of a mother, yeah. you know, including the staff, right? You know, I talked about it in the film, you know, a number of us come from, you know, um, home, dysfunctional. dysfunctional, you know, homes. And so, uh, you know, I can, I can personally attest and say that the course of my life has changed and the reason why I was able to do the work that I did in this film with these young people was because I had people who invested in me, invest in someone, okay? That's super, super important. And don't invest in someone because they're, just because they're family. Invest in young people that don't look like you. You know, I've had people invest in me and I can, you know, I can point to this front row here. You know, this is my family here, and they've invested in me in countless ways. And because of their investments and deposits into my life, I was able to then pass that on to the young people that I was serving to instill hope. Just like everyone else on this panel, they've had people invest in them as well. Be that to someone else. Be that to that young person that you feel like is a nuisance in your community. Be that to that young lady that you know you see that, that looks desperate and, and destitute and hopeless. Be that. Be that. Yeah. Thank you. I, yeah. I, I, I want to, um, maybe because of what I'm seeing, um, it's so much more macro. Um, the reason how these young people got here. And so for me, because of my vision and what I'm seeing more in my role and what my life has happened in my life to make me see these things, I'm realizing, one, anybody doing this work, anybody in these rooms have to understand that our young people don't need saviors. We need believers. They need to know that these young people are brilliant all by themselves. With the right opportunity, they will excel like anybody else. They don't, I don't need to save nobody. I believe that they're great, and all my job is to open the door to let them walk through it. That's one. Two, the Globe Spotlight talked about black families making $8 in the city of Boston to 247,000 of their white counterpart. That is a real thing. Poverty is a real thing. It's not a mistake, and that is the macro. Our young people, when we're talking about programs and services, we're talking about something systematic more than that. Street Safe was a great program, but it was not gonna save that many kids. Like it was, it had to be something bigger than that. Our young people are facing systemic issues that are real, that are every day. So every five that we got out, it was five the more that came in. This is a reality that we're facing in our city and in the cities across this country. When we talk about poverty, we're talking about the dollar. And we gotta create and put put pressure on government to make sure that as this, city's, as this city gets more contracts, that they're making sure they're diversifying the contracts who's getting them. When we talk about CEOs, we're diversifying folks that's on these boards. When we talk about um, our corporate partners, we're making sure that there's a diverse people there because what it shows is that when you diversify a workforce, more people will get hired from diverse communities. Just so happens the leaders and the CEOs are not people of non-color. And that's just the reality in our city, and that's why some of the things that we're faced with from poverty, 
No program's going to save a, a city full of young people that are dealing with poverty issues. Yeah, we can get you a job. Yeah, we can get you mental health counseling. But if you go home where you are starving and cannot pay the bills and make sure that you are straight, then that is still going to force you to think otherwise on how you provide for your family. And that's a human mindset. You put me in the same situation as a man who has a beautiful 10-year-old and I can't provide for her, that will make my mind start to think other things. And that ain't about no drugs, that ain't about nothing else, that's just about a man being able to provide for his family. So when we talk about these things, we're talking about systematic things. We're not talking about a program. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't start by a program, and we ain't going to end it with a program. We got to get busy as a collective, and that's about making sure that we're diversifying and making sure that the dollar's reaching different races and different cultures in this city. And, and, I, and I just, I'm going to close it out. I'm going to close it out with this thought, right? Think, think about this, right? This is, this is something that, this is something that, 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 that was, this is biblical. This is what Jesus said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we start learning how to love one another the same way, things will change. If we start to love one another like we love ourselves, things will change. And that's really the bottom line with no restrictions. Just love, that's it. I, I just think, like, who sees this film? Police departments, like you said, CEOs, anybody that wants to do business in Boston, anybody that wants to do new business, building things. I mean, right now, the gentrification, like, we're seeing more haves, less have-nots, and a lot less have-sums. Like, middle class is gone. So, so it's, it's, it's so far spread out that Anybody that wants to put a dollar or make a dollar from Boston needs to see this film. They need to see that there's kids, there's families, there's people out there that really want to do good, but the opportunities really aren't there. I mean, to, the fact that the, the school that you work at doesn't have like an automatic uh, connection, talk about a pipeline, why isn't there a pipeline to the unions? Why isn't there a pipeline to, to all the tech stuff? Why isn't there a pipeline to, you know, wh whatever they want to do that's, that's not necessarily college, doing hair, doing, like, why aren't they walking out of high school with certificates ready to go to business? It you know, should be it, a natural pipeline. It, it, yeah, do it the other way. To all the sites, construction sites in Boston, or in, in what, metropolitan Boston. And, and I'll leave it on a positive note. So. In Boston, this most recent election, we have a new sheriff with a new mindset. We have a new Suffolk County DA with a new mindset. And we happen to have a new congresswoman with a new mindset Hello. going out and, and, and going to represent what's going on in Boston at the, you know, at the, uh, the national level. So there's hope. And I'll, and I'll end it with the question that you guys or, or the filmmakers were asking the kids, where do you see this in 10 years? So, so before you answer, Donnell, we've been asked to wrap things up. Maybe we can take these, speak about this after. But, but basically, anyone wanting to support the film, we do have a website. Uh, it's Create a Buzz on, on a Facebook page, Create a Buzz Doc Films with a K. Um, <laughs> So again, we're looking to do screenings. We're trying to work out so we can do a broadcast deal, ultimately to get it out to everyone. And um, again, we appreciate you uh, coming here tonight and to the Institute, to David uh, Harris, and to these incredible people who are doing, as Omira said, incredible work. Maybe uh, if you have a quick question, ma'am, and, and then maybe we can each wrap it up. Thank you. My question, in a way, follows up on the previous speakers. It's really about the public education system we have right now in Boston and preventing the kind of situations that are described um, in the film and young men being pushed out of school or dropping out. Do you have any specific thoughts on what the Boston public schools could be thinking about from the elementary level right now as we move towards this vision of wraparound services? Thank you. I'll say this, uh, you know, 
I, um, I have a degree, a master's degree in education, and one of the things that's really important, I think, is that, you know, we don't, we don't understand that young people learn differently, that there's different types of learning styles, and that we're not, we're teaching in an archaic system that's only teaching one way. We need to be really mindful that we need to engage all learners in this school system. Um, so, I, I mean, I think, I think that's one way to start. As an educator, I want to keep it real. There's two types of education, and it's systematic as well. They take care of all, provide all the resources for the exam schools. <clears throat> and excuse me, don't get me wrong. I'm not offended. I mean, I don't want to offend anybody because my, my nephew went to Boston Latin. But the same resources, the same monies, the same support for the Latins and the Latin academies and, and, and the uh, uh, O'Brien would share a building with Madison. The same resources should be for the public schools. But what I've noticed is, okay, the demographics and the breakdown, racial breakdowns, the public schools are predominantly brown and black, small percentage of white, and the exam schools are predominantly white with a small percentage of blacks. So something's wrong with that picture. All children matter. All children matter. Not just the smarter kids. All children matter. So we need to get people that are really doing right by the public, Boston public school system. We need to get the right people in place that really care about all children and not about the title and the paycheck. Because that's what's down at the bowling building right now. People that all they care about is their paycheck, their position, and the next job that they can get, and not about the children that they're being paid to serve. So uh, I do have a comment for you, but before the gentleman leaves over there, you asked how could young people get a voice. They get a voice by individuals such as yourself creating an environment. It might be you renting a conference room at the library and having some young people come and lead a discussion so they could talk about what it is they want to happen. It could be business owners. I also own a restaurant, and I open my restaurant to youth to come in and learn how to be writers, right, so that they can become self-published. Uh, often at times we deal, if you looked at the movie, talked about um, our youth, they're in, they're in love with, you know, being rappers and singers and things of that nature. But if you can explain to a young man, you know, you could become an author, and your royalty per book is gonna be more than uh, uh, Little Wayne or somebody's making per album. You understand, give them something they can relate it to. So you, you give them a voice by individuals such as ourselves, you folks out here, everyone who's sitting here, opening up a venue for them, a safe place for them that allows them to then start speaking and coming up with some ideas. And then we collectively, as adults, have to back their ideas, whether it is with resources, with space, or anything like that. Ma'am, um, they should probably take the educational system in the whole United States and flush it down the toilet. That's just the truth. We're nowhere where we used to be educationally worldwide. And if you think about it, so I have, a young, I have quite a few young men who by the grace of God, we got into some of the independent schools like your Thayer Academies, your St. Seps, things of that nature, right? So I look at the vocabulary this young man was getting in the ninth grade. And I looked at the vocabulary that some of my other football players were getting in the ninth grade. Well, what they were getting in the ninth grade at Thayer and St. Seps was damn sure preparing them for college. What they were getting in the ninth grade at English and at Dorchester Collegiate Academy, might as well have been third grade vocabulary. So when, when, when you think about it, now you have to think about the ISEE, the, you know, the SATs, the MCATs, and things of that nature. If, by the grace of God, I was at Latin Academy, sorry, coach. Um, and uh, so, you know, we, we consistently, come on, man, Latin was standard. Then you had to also take an additional language. So now when it came time to take standardized exams, we weren't spooked because we understood the vocabulary. See, four plus four always gonna equal eight. You damn sure ain't gonna cheat us when it comes to math. You dig? But if you can keep away the analytical thinking, if you keep the vocabulary away, if you, if you keep the grammar away, right, if you keep all that away, 
ooh, the tide is changing. So the solution is probably burn the damn whole system and start fresh. Yeah, thank, thank you everyone. And <laughs>